Hello, everybody. Welcome to our final clash of the correspondence prior to game week 38 this Sunday. And today we're going to be looking ahead to a big game at Goodison Park on Sunday. We are joined by our Everton correspondent, Sean at Spirit underscore Blues. How are you, Sean? All good, James. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you, mate. And we are joined by our Bournemouth correspondent, Neil at AFC BNG. How are you, Neil? Hello. Uh, well, well, hopefully better on Sunday. <laughs> well, fingers crossed for you. No offence, Sean. <laughs> but yeah, I think a, a lot of people will hope that you're feeling a little bit better on Sunday. We'll, we'll get on to that. But before we do, we was, we was just about to hit record. And it reminded me that you two both met each other at our live show in Manchester. And you obviously turned up en route to going to Burnley that day. And you just told me that was one of the worst days of your life. Do you want to tell me about it? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, it was it was sort of one of those games where uh, we went there. I was fairly confident that we might get something out of it. We certainly on the on the balance of play um, probably should have got something out of it, but it was one of the most <sighs> farcical games in, for VAR I think I've ever seen. Um, for those that uh, perhaps what didn't watch it on match of the day, we had a goal disallowed um, for a handball in the box where it hit the top of his Adam Smith's shoulder. What that meant was that uh, we went from scoring a goal, celebrating an equalising goal, to a uh, to that to Burnley having a penalty within uh, a run of play. Um, basically, if we hadn't scored the goal, they wouldn't have got the penalty. Which <laughs> it was, it was probably one of the most unfortunate incidents of of the whole season. And yeah, listen, I was very much of the opinion at the time that there was no way that it could be given. A, was it Adam Smith's arm? Was it? There was, it was no way that it could be given as a, a penalty against you. You guys will know my feeling anyway. It's like the emotion of the game. You're a fan of VAR, Sean? Um, funnily enough, no. Not Is now. anybody? <laughs> No. I was just I was just looking as well, Neil, because obviously Sunday's very much in terms of importance is very much about yourselves. Obviously, three points adrift of Watford and Villa at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know you've got a win, and then you need favours from there. The two games after Burnley, you didn't play too bad. That that no. fixture, you drew with Chelsea two two, and then lost to Anfield. Then there was the lockdown, and I think for many of us, the Palace game when you returned was so flat. Couldn't believe really what I was watching. The fact that they basically came and outplayed you. Yeah. Then Newcastle did the same. Yep. And you think you're doomed, really. You can't, yep. you're not scoring goals, conceding too many goals. But here we are, and there is still a glimmer of a chance. How are you feeling at the moment about the chances for the weekend? <sighs> I'm, it's, it's a hard one. I think a lot of fans that I've spoke, spoken to. I think we, we we're of the opinion that we're not going to be in the Premier League next year. Um, I think any other year, we the way we played, we should have been dead and buried. It's only because there's six teams at the bottom that have. Oh, I mean, to be frank, all deserve to go down this year. It's just it's it's us at the moment that are in the position where um, where we are. Uh, I don't think we've been much worse than Brighton, West Ham, or Villa, to be honest this year but it's football what does it come down to though because when you look at sort of the goals conceded column it kind of looks the same as it always does you, you've yep. never come up and not been shipping goals so presumably yeah. the issues at the other end right yeah I mean I think I, I think we're the we, we're the first team to have conceded 60 goals five seasons in a row um, so that, that I mean that's the same as it always has been the problem is we've we've had no creativity um at all we've had no thrust we went a period uh, over christmas where that was our crucial period we played brighton we played west ham norwich um and we just didn't score and you can't not score against those teams and stay up right it's a good save from steve cook at norwich though mate fantastic save um not so good live from the stands but um <laughs> Well, uh, you mentioned them three games were all away games. I think you lost 1 0, 2 0, and 4 0, respectively. And no yeah. matter what circumstance Bournemouth would have been in previously, you would have expected the team to be scoring goals there. You and I yeah. met up before you played at Tottenham in, in I think it was November. It was just after Mourinho yeah. took over us. And I was staggered about how, 
how down you were on things about exactly what you've just said, lack of creativity in the team. You've obviously had Brooks absent for most of the mm-hmm. season. I, I bless him. I don't think he's fully fit yet. And Ryan Fraser, thoughts on that? I think he could have handled it better. I think, I think he'll look back and regret it. Is my gut, but you know, I, I don't blame him. Uh, I, I think we'd all do the same in his circumstances. Would we? I'm not. I'm not sure we would actually. Well, yeah. Well, uh, well, you'd risk an injury for. I mean, he's got one more. I mean, he'll he'll sign a bigger contract than he had with us, right? You would assume in his next next role. Um, he, he could have got an injury in this period and then not be, uh, you know, be out on his ear, right? I don't think Bournemouth would have done that to him, but I get why you would do that. I think you're taking that very well, mate, because I'd be fucking raging if that was one of mine. I can bet that Sean would be. Sean, <laughs> Sean, Sean loves it when people pull out of things, especially people pulling out of tackles at Tottenham like I saw a few times a few weeks ago, mate. <laughs> what's Monday was better, but if we can go back before Monday, Sean, what what what's been going on? Because it's been down, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's it's been it's been strange since we come back, um, and I I'm, I've struggled to put my finger on why there's been such a massive drop off in the team going forward. So uh, by and large, we've still been pretty solid at the back, the Wolves game apart. But offensively, um, I've, I've put some tweets out recently showing our XG drop off. And, and I can't, I'm really struggling to understand why. So one, one theory I had was that potentially, even though I really don't like either of them, that we were missing Delph and or Schneiderlin because neither of them have played since we've come back. And up until recently, Theo Walcott hadn't either. Um, but I think it's more more to do with the attitude of the players and also fitness because we haven't we haven't got a massive squad of players that we can rotate through through these games. And I think people do tend to forget just how many games there's been in such a short short space of time. Um, so certainly, I think fatigue and attitude of players has played a big part in it. And I think it's took Ancelotti to come out and have a pop at them publicly to trigger that game and uh, the reaction in the game that we saw against Sheffield United where they more resemble the team that we're having a go. I know you've been in full support of Ancelotti. I've, I've never really seen you make a critical comment about him, but it must be a little concern then you, you're saying he's had to come out publicly and dress them down. Do you think just like in terms of within the squad, there's something culturally wrong with it at the moment? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, well, that's part of why I am quite critical of the recruitment over the years because I think under David Moyes, first and foremost, the will to win needed to be there, the mentality needed to be there. He knew what type of player you needed to be to play for Everton and play at Goodison Park every other week and get the fans on side. And I think since he left, We've come away from that and we, we, we've tried to go down a road of signing more technical players and then play more football. Um, but I, I'm very much, if you're not a club who can attract the very best footballers, I think it's a flawed philosophy to think you can sign sort of second rate players and out football the better teams. I think you've got to come up with a different philosophy. And the guy across the road, I think, recognised that. And that's why he's ended up winning the league and being successful. Because all the all of the the, the things that people, football purists, you know, now and nowadays don't really look at so much at free kicks, indirect free kicks, corners. It's almost people want to sort of phase it out the game and diminish the impact that it has. But for me, it's those marginal gains that take you into first place, get you pushing for, for trophies. And that's what Ancelotti's done. The minute he walked through the door at Everton, he's realised, well, hang on, we, we should not be conceding as many goals from set pieces. We should be scoring far more goals from set pieces with the players that we have. Whereas the players that we've currently got we're not. They're not good enough to out football most of the teams in this league, and that to me is why you know I, I'm finally 
you know, can fully get behind the manager that we've got because of the approach he's taken is right for our football club. I was a bit critical when he took over because I think, and I don't think you particularly disagree, I think for what Everton Football Club want to be, I think it's a mass rebuilding job in terms of everything, the new stadium that's coming. It's not, an, if there was to be an overnight fix and you finished fourth next year, it probably wouldn't be sustainable for the following year. You need to build something a, a little, little bit, more gradually, if you will, to, to get there and stay to where the football club really wants to be. And the reason I was critical of Ancelotti was, I think it's probably a 10-year project, mate. And he's probably not going to be there in 10 years. It's not a criticism of him personally. I just wonder if, therefore, you would have been better off looking at a younger coach in the first instance. But I know you're in full support of him, mate. Uh, yeah, I, think, I think the thing with, with, with Carlo Ancelotti, uh, and you'll know from me tweet, um, I was a big big fan of Rafa Benitez and, and wanted Rafa Benitez. And again, me, you know, Ancelotti is, 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 for me, is, you know, a level up again from Rafa. But I, I recognise that we need somebody who, who tactically is very, very good. And, and that will allow us to compensate for the fact we can't go out and get the best players that there are available. Even if, even if money was no object. And that's, that's not the case at Everton. It, it gets sort of over overblown and hyped up that we've got all this money but money we haven't got as much money as, as some people might think and certainly we've wasted a lot of it in the last couple of years but that having that manager who and, and again I've said it to you on, on, on other episodes it was one of the gripes I had about Silva he played the same formation the same philosophy the same tactics week in week out and we've already seen with Carlo in recent weeks He'll change different formations. He'll mix it up. Nobody. It's very, very difficult for me now to predict who's going to be in the team, whereas previous managers have been very, very easy. So, you know, people will get in touch and say, will, will Carl but we play at the weekend or will Moyes Keen get a game? You know, if, if, if we've got all our defenders fit who play, it, it's difficult because you don't know because he will change the formation and the style to suit the opposition. And, and that's absolutely what we need, somebody who can do that for us, and he's a great leveller for me. He he will do well for us because he wants he wants to go to a club where he will get the time. Previously, he, he's been in charge of football clubs where they've got the players, they've got the squad, the lad the lad to it. But it's there you go, Carlo, go and go and win us what you can win us in the next year. And if you don't win us what we think we should win, you're out the door, off your pop. And he goes somewhere else and he does it again. Um, but having, having read his book, um, he's very much now at a stage of his life where he, he almost wants to go back to when he started and get hold of a football club, develop the youth and, and stay there for many years. And I think Everton is the perfect club for him at this stage in his career. And he's the perfect manager for us. So I think it's, it's very much the right fit. And people who think that he's come to us because he must have been prom promised hundreds of millions of pounds to spend, I think we'll be in for a bit of a surprise because we won't go on to spend hundreds of millions of pounds um, anytime soon. But I think, you know, Carlo understands that and is happy to work with the young players that we've got at the club and we'll bring more in um, in, the, in the following transfer windows. Emphatic answer on the manager there, mate. I can't really argue that. I, Neil, your manager, I think yeah. after, after the Wolves game, I felt it for him. He looked like he wanted to be anywhere but where he was. Um, but he feels a bit, I think probably since the Tottenham game and then obviously there was the Leicester result, felt like he had a bit of his stride back. I don't know if Southampton's knocked him again. I feel like, and it might be wrong, it's just an outsider's opinion that he's, he's perhaps questioned himself a little bit. He will be, his. he is his own worst critic. Um, I don't think there's any real concern from the fan base like certainly as, as a Bournemouth fan regardless of what, which division we're playing in next year I wouldn't want any other manager still I think there is uh, there is a key it's going to be a key summer for us either way there's a huge amount of rebuilding that needs to go ahead and I don't want anyone else to to do that so I, I, he would have my total support I think he'll have the boards as well my only concern is because he is his own worst critic, will he put his hands up and say, "Actually, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave because I think that's what's best for the club," whether or not that's true or not. So that that's what concerns me. Not that he will go 
because he'll be pushed out, but because he may want to step down because he'll feel bad about the situation. I think ordinarily the best thing I would say that he needs to do is, he doesn't strike me as an impulsive person, but I think you nailed it there. I get the feeling that he maybe thinks, I can't get it to what it looked like it, it would be at certain points where there's been occasions in the last couple of years where you thought, these lot are going to finish top half, which would be remarkable. And I get the feeling he's probably looking at it now and going, the best case scenario next year is still in the Premier League and probably battling relegation again. Do I mentally, physically want to go through it again? Ordinarily, you'd go, listen, take a week off, mate, and see how you feel. The problem is, especially, especially if you go down, actually, that you need to hit the ground running in terms of what you're doing for next season and that. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that uh, to an extent. Uh, Eddie don't, never seems to take time off anyway, which I think <laughs> isn't necessarily a good thing. Uh, I was reading an article uh, on the BBC earlier where it had, we've got seven players leaving this year um, under normal circumstances. There's going to be a lot of rebuilding, especially if we go down. If we go down, um, we'll lose half of our first team easily. Um, Wilson King, Lerma, um, Brooks probably. Um, Ake, 100, Ake's gone either way. Um, so we'll need to rebuild that and... It, yeah, we're going to need to hit the ground running either way. But none of them players are out of contract, though. Am I right in saying that? Uh, none of those ones that I've just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, so we will get money for them. Yeah, and I think that's important. I, I don't think financially there's not a a major concern for Bournemouth. Would that be fair if you do go down? We need to find. I I saw on Twitter we need to find 120 million from somewhere. Hell. Uh, Ake is rumoured to have been to be going for about 35. Is that it? Um, yeah. That's peanuts modern market, mate. I know. Uh, I, I'd have thought he, he, if if Maguire's 80 million, uh, Ake should be double what he, what, 35, but he's, he's only got a year left. And if we go oh, down, okay. if we go down, we can't, we, we're, it's, it's a buyer's market, right? No, that'll explain it. If he's only got a year left on the contract, that explains the, the, the value in him because you think yeah. um, young profile resale value I think Bournemouth could have certainly been I'm not his biggest fan actually to be honest Nathan Aki but I think you could have been asked in excess of 50 million particularly as the rumours we've heard the last week or so appears to be that it's, it's potentially going to be Manchester City in yep. which case fleece them if you can for God's sake yeah well exactly I think the problem for us as well is it's the worst summer to be selling a load of stuff uh, having to do a do a sale because no one, none of the mid table teams are really going to have money this year. Um, so perhaps some of those assets that aren't going to go wouldn't go to top six. So for example, I don't know, maybe Jefferson Lerma. If we go down, really, we'd want probably 30, 30 million for him. No one's going to pay anywhere near that. No ever and my... <laughs> Funnily enough, that was actually mentioned uh, in my uh, friend group. He said Everton haven't bought one of our players for a while. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, if we can get a million for every yellow card he's had, we'll be uh, we'll be laughing. I mean, he he <laughs> he's <laughs> such a nasty footballer, mate. I know he does what you need in certain games, but he he is an awful, horrible bastard. That Lerma, he he doesn't he's there to wind people up, and he he doesn't yeah. hesitate twice take people out. I mean, in fairness, there's times where Sean could do with a player like that in his in his team. In fairness, I'm not suggesting that Evans should go and buy him. But um, it might be something, for example, that Sean thinks he's missing from the midfield. It might be, Sean, relating back to what you said. I know you're not big fans of Delph or Schneidlin, but perhaps there is a correlation with the results not being as good with them two not in the team, maybe. Yeah, there's no, there's nobody, there's just no one in the midfield who can, who can win a tackle. So, um, you know, it's, the floodgates are always open. You just go through the middle of us. Um, Gomez, <laughs> He gets dribbled past far too far too easy. So there's no there's no resistance. I, you know, I was moaning at it about it when we had Garner because he was the only player that I felt we had that stemmed the tide and and he was he was such a good player in his ability to get round the pitch. He almost done the work of, of two holding midfielders. So he's been a big miss aligned with the fact that then Gabamin, who was brought in to replace him, has had terrible issues with injuries and so we haven't seen him yeah I mean Garner huge miss huge miss yeah. I mean he's, in terms of his good days he's comparable to Kante when he's he's absolutely yeah. out of it and none of us know if Gabam is capable of being a replacement yeah. or not because the majority yeah. of us haven't even seen him kick a ball yeah. right no that, that's it yeah and now when he comes back 
you know, these injuries are bound to have had an effect on him. I, I think I watched I watched a game at Sheffield United on Monday, and I think one of the reasons <clears throat> um, Gomez and Davis looked a lot better essentially is because it's not the sort of area where Sheffield United particularly hurt you. It's it's always no, in the flank right. areas. Yeah. Um, that's why I think they were able to dictate play a lot better than what we've seen in previous weeks. And I also felt, and I don't know how you feel about it, I thought you were better for having Richarlison in a deeper position. Because the, the one thing I felt like when Ferguson did the, the Everton game and stuff like that, it felt like putting them two up front together, Richarlison and Calvert-Lewin, yeah. felt like having a real big impact, right, they'll score goals, etc. But you, you still need to get the ball to them. And I just felt him being deeper, because he's a quality footballer, again, gave you a little bit more domination in terms of the game. And Bulldog wasn't thinking, oh, well, I'm not worried about what Bernard's doing here or Iwobi, for etc. He was thinking, well, if I let this kid go, he might do me some damage. So I think that had a positive effect. Do you think Richarlison stays wide now for Sunday? Because it looked a lot better to me with that set up this week. No, I think I think we'll play 4-4-2. Um, I think we'll go back to that. Now, whether, whether we should is, is, is another another thing. Um, it, I, you, I can see the benefits to playing 4-2-3-1 and having Richarlison out, out wide. Um, but, but you know... Again, we spoke about Gilfie Sigurdsson and, and last year he was fantastic in that role as a 10. You know, he, he scored 13, 14 goals, whatever it was. But for some reason, he's just disappeared this season. It, you know, it, he looks like his legs have gone, but his, his ability at scoring goals, it, it's just vanished. I think so. I, I can't believe what I see with him because when you got him off Swansea, I mean... We shouldn't have sold him to Swansea in the first instance. Pochettino walked in the door at the same time. Pochettino didn't want him to go, but the agreement was already there for Spurs to get Ben Davis and Michelle Vaughan in time so, um, in return. So the deal was already done. And Siggy was always restricted with us because he has to play wide, basically, because of Ericsson. Yeah. So he never really got the proper chance at Tottenham. He looked great at Swansea. As you said, looked good for you last year. At the end of last season, 80% of us are thinking, well, if his price goods next season, he's all starting in our FPL teams. Nailed. And he's probably been the biggest FPL letdown of the season. The fact that we don't even want to like talk no. about him. He he's no. not someone you could consider as an option uh, on a free hit for this Sunday. He doesn't even come into the conversation, and that's staggering, really, because he's such a talent. I thought he was better yeah. Monday night. It was the best I'd seen him play for a long time, and I think in that system and in that role is his best position. Yeah. But I, I think his his decline is staggering this season. Yeah, yeah, and and that's something that. We've seen all too, all too often with some of the players. Um, a similar thing happened with Ashley Williams when we signed him. His first season for Cumin, he was fantastic. Um, because we sold John Stones to Manchester City, um, and I wasn't. I'm not a big fan of John Stones because I, I think he's fantastic on the ball, but he he just doesn't smell danger. I think defensively he's very very poor. And um, we brought Ashley Williams in, and within a few months, you could see the improvement in Everton defensively. And that was the season we finished seventh by a country mile. And unfortunately, we didn't go and kick on the following season. But the drop-off in Ashley Williams from that season to the next Bad. was massive. And, and it's amazing. I, I, I don't quite understand what happens with professional footballers where their performance can go from high, high level to they just look bang average. And, don't, you know, Gilfie Gilf Sigurdsson is, is the biggest disappointment for me this season by, by a country mile. And I really, really liked Sigurdsson. And as much as I wasn't happy that we were signing somebody at that price, at that age, he was somebody I wanted to see play for Everton. Um, and last season, I thought, yeah, you know, this, I was right. This, this was the lad I wanted to see. This is what I thought he could do. Um, but this season, just it, blow, it just blows my mind why. The drop off has been so so massive. So, am, I, am I right in saying Sigerson and Rooney came the same summer? Is that right? N um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I remember thinking at the time the whole it was obviously on the cards that Rooney was coming back, yeah. and I, I think that's part of the mistakes you've made in the market. Yeah. It was like you didn't need both of those players. No, but we signed we signed David Klassen as well. Six yes. A pounder. <laughs> we yeah. For, three it was number, just three forgotten number from Ajax, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Completely forgotten player. Neil, how are you best going to go about winning this game on Sunday, mate? Is it 
Bournemouth at their best in like a four four two slash four two four. How are you going to do this? Four four two hasn't really worked for us. Um, it will go down to uh, our, our, our back four will be the same as it's been. Um, I would like to see sort of a, a five in the middle sort of situation. Um, so four two three one is what I hope. Um, and then we'll go we'll go from there. So I'm hoping to see Stanislas and Brooks. Um, we'll probably see then King and Wilson up top, but I wouldn't mind um, a little bit of Solanke. Um, if it comes to that. Yeah, I, I've been speaking Solanke up um, a little bit. I mean, obviously, since the Leicester game and that. But I know how talented he is. We've seen that from yeah. his performances for England at youth level and that. And I think even the, the glimmers of what we've seen for him at Liverpool and that. I know definitely there's a player in there. And I sort of half joked earlier in the week that actually if I bought a Bournemouth player on my free hit this week, it, it maybe would even still be Solanke, even though... He didn't play for you on Sunday. I couldn't believe that he didn't start personally. No, I couldn't either. It's it's such a change because it's a weird one because Solanke has always been while well, he's looked like an absolute donkey this year. To be somewhat frank, he you can tell he's one of those players that's actually trying on the pitch. Like he might not know where the goal was for most of the games, but he was actually tr- he was you know putting a bit of a shift in. Um, so. Whereas something sort of flicked against Leicester, and you kind of saw what we bought. Admittedly, it's a little bit late now, but but yeah, uh, he, he funny enough as well. I think he could be one of the players if we do go down that might benefit from that, because I think he would he would stay and try and cement that first team striker role for us. And with having a little bit of extra space on the ball and a little bit of extra time that you get in the Championship, it might let him re- rediscover that like youth spirit that he had where he was just lethal right oh, I, I, I genuinely I think if he's playing for you in the championship next year I'd be asking the bookies what price for top goal scorer um, I think he would do excellent things in that league and I think he'll stay around and be excellent in the Premier League whether it's with yourselves in the future or with someone else I'm convinced he's got the talent you, you mentioned there that he's been putting the effort is there therefore Neil is there players you think at the moment that haven't been it's a difficult one. Um, since since we got back, uh, I'll talk since we got back because um, before it was slightly different. But we touched on Lerma, for example. He's been a totally different player since we got back. He he was arguably one of our better players pre lockdown. Um, he just hasn't looked anything. Like he looks like he's uh, looking, you know, ready to leave now. Um, some of the forward players. Um, perhaps haven't been at their best but then the past few games uh against Leicester against uh against yourselves Spurs uh and even against Saints I think we've looked everyone on that pitch looked like they were really going for it it's just it was those first few games and I don't know why we didn't turn up against Palace and Newcastle Palace and Newcastle were the two mate that put you in. yeah uh, do you know what you problem is you mentioned the Tottenham game there and my goodness I just had the flashbacks remembering that I played played the two of you consecutively within four days which I struggled to stay awake through. My goodness, what a couple of games of football those two were. Um, Sean, hopes for Sunday or or does it matter? Do you you expect to win on Sunday? Yeah, I could see it going any one of the three three ways, to be honest. It wouldn't wouldn't surprise me if if we got turned over. It really wouldn't. Um, And equally, it wouldn't surprise me if we won. It just depends which Everton turns up. I think if the Everton turns up that played you know, with the same determination as Sheffield United, I think we will win. Uh, but if, I, if I said to you, Sean, that I'm on my free hit and there were five Everton players under consideration for me, would you say I was nuts? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would. A few names, just to give you some opinion. Luca Dean. Now he's capable in terms of the attacking return. One game week punt. Any interest? Uh, what is he, 5.9? Well, he, he he can always get a return, can't he, Luca Dina? But but the, the, I don't think there's much to support that it will happen. That's that's my only thing there. Okay, Michael Keane nine and fifteen point returns since the restart. We, we I'm 
I am very confident we will not keep a clean sheet. And it doesn't score many goals. Okay, so I won't, I won't ask you about young Braithwaite either then. No, same applies. Just, just quickly though, opinions on him? Pro- yeah, promising. He's made I a promise. He's made a right, yeah. 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 yeah, you know, he's only 18. <laughs> I think he'd only played about nine games for Carlisle when we, when we bought him. Um, oh, so he's not come so, through the academy then, no? No, no we, we, we bought him in January. Right. Uh, How much did you pay? I think it was about 900,000, 990,000, something like that. Salt and vinegar crisp, basically. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Calvert Lewin Richarlison. Richarlison. I see if you had to go one, that's where you go. You'd pay the extra. Yeah. Calvert Lewin's due, isn't he? He is. He is. But, but he's, he's been due for about four weeks and it's not paid out. So I would go, I would go Richarlison. Yeah, shame for Calvert Lewin. I think lockdown come at a really bad time for him. He'd had six returns in six games prior to the four 0 defeat at Chelsea, which was your last one before shutdown. And obviously, your performances yeah. before Chelsea were very good. Yeah, he's not. He's not clinic. He's not clinical, Dom, and, and and he never. He never will be. Bless him. He's a different. He's a different type of striker. So I think his goal return is is fantastic for the type of striker that he is. Um, eerily. There's not many better than him in the league. He's one more headers than um, the other fella from over the road, the play centre half that everyone loves. Um, Lovren. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you've won more headers than Lovren. <laughs> That's one player that does give people a sniff when he's playing for yeah. Liverpool, mate. What, Thirteen well, goals, Calvert Lewin, mate. <laughs> Hey, 13, 13 goals yeah, for exactly. Calvert Lewin in the league. Exactly. It's good. Yeah, yeah. You would have it looked is. at restart and said he's got half a shot at the Golden Boot, even potentially, if he if he carried on the form he was showing prior to lockdown. He's got he's he's much improved. He's um, under under Carlo and, and Dunk because now he's getting in the positions to miss the chances. Um, so I quite like looking at uh, um, so for score for certain certain bits and pieces about league, you know, league tables for players, so to speak, and big chances missed. Dom is right up there. Um, so on one hand, you think, well, it's a negative. But when you see who he's up there with, and he's up there you know, with, with the likes of the best strikers in the league, it's that old adage about, you know, you've got to be there to miss them. Absolutely. Under, under Silva, he never got in the, he wasn't in the box. So he wasn't, he wasn't ever in the positions to miss them. So he was always, exactly. always going to get goals. Is that because you go back to front a little bit more now? Is it as simple as that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't think that needs to necessarily be oh, it's long ball Everton, but just right. miss out the midfield. I think Ancelotti's identified that there's a weakness there if we can get it into Calvert Lewin, Richarlison quicker, as exactly. proven proven perhaps by Dean's brilliant assist again in the Southampton game, which you were quite yeah. fortunate in. But it was a magnificent goal assisted by Dean and scored by Richarlison. If you, if you can play that, play that. Whereas I think. That yeah. pass under Silva, it would have gone into midfield and yeah. recycled and etc. And you'd have gone from exactly. there. I know, That's... I know completely what you're saying, Neil. Yeah. Can I consider any Bournemouth players this weekend? Yeah, I mean, it would have to be up top. Um, fact is, we need to win, right? That that that, that is the the the, the point. Uh, I wouldn't totally discount. Like you said, Solanke at the price. Uh, I'm not sure what he is, but he'll be somewhere. He's, he's not. He, there'll be some value there. Five point um, one, very cheap. Yeah, well, and he, <laughs> and he, he will at some point he'll get on the pitch. Um, any of the three other three as well. So King, Wilson, Brooks would be would be worth a go. My top tip would be Stanislas. If you were looking okay. at a free hit, free hit, one hit, uh, one game wonder. Stanislas, he'll be taking all everything, uh, all of the set pieces. Since he came back into the team, um, we've looked a totally different team. He's given us a whole more, more balance, um, much more balance there. So, uh, so yeah, he would be my number one pick. He, he's another one. People forget you basically haven't had all season. Mm-hmm. Basically, no. He's paid about ten percent. Free attacking returns. Now he played six hundred and eighty minutes. Um, he's only game to note though that he's played more than 70 minutes so far though was the game against Tottenham um, where anybody could have walked through that game to be very honest with you I wouldn't go there myself but you, you're I guess you're leaning that because of what you said about the set pieces and stuff he'll take the free kicks corners penalties yeah yeah exactly he, well he'll be on penalties uh, if should one uh, come up we're going to be 
playing for we're going to need to play for corners and we're going to need to play for direct free kicks we're this year for whatever reason that's where we've scored from um all of that will be through his his boot he's also got a good direct free kick if he if it's one within shooting range so that would be uh that would be my sort of top tip he's he, my uh my my uh superstition won't let me put him in my own team because I'm not going to free hit in a Bournemouth asset just because of what we've got riding on it. But um, he would be in my list. Do, do I suspect, Neil, that you might be free hitting an Everton player in? 100%. And that would be? <laughs> uh, probably Richarlison. Interesting. I was tempted to put Pickford in as well to try and jinx a clean sheet. But... <laughs> I don't think Jordan Pickford <laughs> needs jinxing, mate, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, have you got any Everton players at the moment? Yeah, I think I've just got young Anthony Gordon on me on me bench. Okay, he's done all right as well. What I've seen of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's good. He didn't have he didn't have much of a bar to beat though with him. But <laughs> I don't know where we did. No, that's <laughs> true. But he kind of got thrown into it a little bit. He started the Merseyside derby, didn't he? Yeah. And I think yeah. a lot of people from the outside yeah. were like, yeah. "Who's that? That's brave." Yeah. So yeah. no, I think he he's done quite well as well. Is his best yeah. position out wide? Would you say? <laughs> He, he, again, he's another player that you know he can play as a he can play as a ten. But um, we've seen enough of him to suggest that you know he's going to feature um, on the left for us next season and, and, and probably save us having to dip into the transfer market for that position, and save our money for some of the other much needed ones. It feels like there's a few kids there, mate. That, that actually with brave weight, Gordon. There are a few signs to come through. And yeah, how yeah. old's Tom Davis? Is he 21 still, Twi- or something? No, I, f- I think he's about 24, Tom. Now. Oh, is he? 23, oh, 24. There, there's me. I'm, I'm stuck in a Jesse Lingard <laughs> world there, apparently. Yeah, I th- I, yeah. I, th- I, th- I think so, because he, he come in with, with um, Holgate and Dom all come in at the same time. I feel like he was, when, when you smashed City in that game 4 0, wasn't he only like 17 or something? 22. Yeah. Ah, oh, thanks, yeah. Neil. I feel a bit better it. now. I, I'll, I'll win. I was closest. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, really, thank you very much. Really enjoyed that. I think what we take away is there seems to be a suspicion that both teams will score this weekend. Those who've been listening to the podcast this week will know that I think this could be the game that goes off. There is normally one in game week 38 that does. And if I was to back one, I think Sean's probably thinking there's no way Everton are scoring loads of goals, mate. That I still think it will be this one. Sean, prediction for Sunday, my friend. I don't know. 2-2. Two, two. I'll go 2-2. Two, two. Neil? 4-3. <laughs> <Two>? 2? <sighs> to us. I, I can't, I can't back, back do you, anything else. Do, do you genuinely have that belief as well that it's going to be a mad one? Yeah. Uh, us versus Everton always is. Look, If you look at the historical game, I think we average something like six goals a game when we play Everton. Um, off from the top of my head. Because um, we had, like, what was it? We had like six one a couple of seasons ago. We had the three three. We've had a couple of really big games against them. That's true. I'd forgotten about it. I actually just remember there was the Lukaku game. Did he get three or four, Sean? Four. Four. Yeah, I think loads yeah. of people had him captain that day, didn't they? Yeah. And then there was there was the mad one at your place, Neil, where didn't wasn't it two nil with five minutes to go uh-huh. and then Everton went in front again in injury time. I can see the pain on Sean's face yeah. and still yeah. didn't win the game, I think, if I remember and, correctly. And uh, just to loop back round, it was Stanislas that scored the two. Interesting. I think that Everton will win about 4-2, personally. I genuinely, Neil, uh, I would love you to stay up. The, the only reason I could possibly think that I'd want you to go down is it's so fucking difficult to get an away ticket. But at the moment, I can't even get an home ticket, mate, so I really shouldn't worry about it too much. I think... Everton might have the edge on you. Um, I think Aki, although the guys without him, I think Lloyd Kelly's done quite well, actually. I think it might be too big of a miss defensively. And the one benefit for you is to know that you're going to have to go for it. I, I would worry for you if news comes in that's not positive because it's obviously it's not out of your control. To hear that Villa are winning or something, I think could be quite deflating and it, it might not go your way. I, I tell you what I could see in that prediction. I could see you going in front and then losing the game, actually. Yeah, I think in a weird way, I think not having a crowd will help us because you're not going to have that either raw because 
let, let's say you're in the 70th minute, we're one nil up, uh, Watford and Villa are losing. You're not going to have that roar from our away end to try and spur them on, but equally they might, <laughs> we might fall can, over. It, yeah. It, it, it can it, go both ways and the players will know. There's no doubt about that. It will be so easy to feed the correct information. Uh, no, exactly. And uh, there, there's part of me, the, the romanticism of how we came up um, doing Watford on goal difference in the last minute. There's part of me that, you know, can lightning strike twice. I wish you luck, mate. I don't mean that disrespectfully, Sean, but I do wish Neil a little bit more this this uh, um, this week. But whatever happens, wish you both luck next season as well. Um, I think we can gather from that, right, it's Richarlison only if it's from Everton. And if we're going to dive in on Bournemouth, it's Junior Stanislas. Avoid them defensively. Thanks very much for that, guys. Um, right, in terms of our content, uh, for patrons, we've got our final preview for game week 38. I might know a little bit more with what I'm doing with my free hit by then. Should timestamp this and say that it's Thursday evening, just in case we get some news that somebody's suddenly out injured on Friday. Um, and I'll be streaming in the lead up to the deadline on Sunday on YouTube as well from around about 1.30 p.m. Um, Sean, Neil, thanks very much. Really enjoyed that. Good luck the weekend. Cue music, please, man, Sharp.